Um, well, thank you for attending this workshop. We're going to be talking about Istio Ambient Mesh. Before we get started, um, I'd like to introduce the folks who will be running the, um, the, the workshop for all of you. So I'm, I'm Christian Posta, the Global Field CTO at Solo.io, and I have with me... Hi, I'm Ron Benham, uh, one of the field engineers at Solo.io. Hi, I'm Nim. I'm a DevRel engineer at Google Cloud. Awesome. So we'll, uh, we'll, this is a hands-on workshop, and as we get into the labs, if you have questions or things aren't working, then you know, put your hand up and one of us will come and uh, try to sort it out for you. How many of you in this room were at um, earlier sessions today, maybe Lynn's session specifically about ambient uh, mesh? Most? Most people? Okay. Um, that's, that's good. We'll do a quick overview of, um, of Ambient Mesh. Um, it sounds like some of you saw the, uh, I think it was the, the life of a packet through uh, Istio Ambient Mesh earlier. Um, and so that, that went into a lot more detail. But what we want to focus on here is setting the context, getting some understanding uh, re revisiting maybe the motivation for building ambient uh, ambient mesh, and then actually getting hands on and, uh, and and deploying it and working through the configuration and the experience of using the Istio ambient mesh. So the the, the first thing that I do want to point out, and how it's related to ambient mesh, is that Istio has been around for quite a while now, and when you take something that is you know, ends up being really critical in your environment, in your platforms, something related to networking, something that's on the data path. You know, it, it takes a while to get that infrastructure to be mature and stable and, uh, you know, able to run in, in these uh, environments. And so Istio has been around for a long time. It's gone through its set of uh, growing pains and uh, ma the maturing process. And, um, you know, now we see, you know, certainly in the Istio community at, at Solo, uh, working with our customers, we see Istio uh, is probably the most deployed service mesh, certainly at enterprise scale and extremely complex uh, scenarios. Um, and Istio was just recently, I think September 28th, um, added to the, the CNCF officially, so it's part of the... CNCF landscape, or CNCF uh, projects. And earlier in September, we, uh, we being uh, the Istio community, but it was, a, it was a joint effort before that to kind of prove out the concept through various POCs and building the APIs and understanding the various components and trade-offs that we might need to make. Uh, it, was a, it was a joint collaboration between uh, our engineering team at Solo and, and Google. And this came about because we had been researching and digging into how we would um, kind of solve some of the, the problems around service mesh adoption that um, we felt like the sidecar model was uh, kind of inhibiting that. And, uh, and, and we started working on that um, and sharing some of the things that we were doing publicly and, uh, and ended up working with, uh, with Google on, on trying to prove this out and then announced it to the, uh, the open source project in September. The motivations for building out Istio Ambient Mesh um, are primarily around operations and onboarding and incremental adoption of a mesh. So I know, we, I, like, like I said, if you've seen the overview uh, that, that we've done earlier today, you'll see that things like Sidecars are not first class concepts in Kubernetes, for example. Controlling the life cycle of the containers of the sidecar itself and how it's related to the workload container, you know, there's, a, there's an inherent race condition there. Things like job resources. So you run a job resource with a sidecar and the job completes and the sidecar keeps running. So there, there's, there's these use cases that make the sidecar not as transparent as we like and even more burdensome in upgrade scenarios. 
when we need to either upgrade because there are new versions, new features we want to take advantage of, or there are CVEs that have been discovered that necessitate upgrading and, and patching the, the, the service mesh. And so for, for operational reasons, and there, there's a lot more, um, actually, uh, Lynn Sun and I wrote a, uh, a quick little 40-page guide, a book introducing uh, Istio Ambient Mesh that we have uh, physical copies that we'll be signing at the end of this workshop, I think, uh, outside at the Solo booth. But you can also go online and get an e-book e uh, about that. Uh, that that'll go into uh, more detail and, and uh, more of that motivation, certainly around the operational side. Now, there are some side benefits. I feel like there's side benefits. Like I said, the operational aspects are the, uh, were the motivation and the number one reason. Um, now, some of these side benefits include the, um, the cost reduction. I think we did a talk on, um, on, the, on some of the cost savings and we did a blog on this as well. Uh, so, and as well as the, some of the security posture. We did a blog on istio.io about, uh, um, about Istio Ambient's security posture and, um, and in, in, in some areas how that can be approved by, improved by not uh, using sidecars. So what is uh, Istio Ambient Mesh? It is a sidecarless implementation of the Istio data plane that, um, like I said, focuses more on deploying the mesh and operating the mesh transparently from the applications, not tying the data plane to, or, or not tying the application to a particular infrastructure component's lifecycle. Uh, so you can make these uh, upgrades and patches independent of, uh, of, of the applications. Uh, and then there are these, uh, these benefits to reducing the, uh, the number of proxies that are running, the provisioning of resources in advance, um, and, uh, and, and getting some of the, uh, when, when you run at scale, being able to optimize the, uh, the, the amount of compute and, uh, and resource that you need to run the service mesh. So the way that it works is instead of running a sidecar proxy, a full-blown layer seven sidecar proxy next to each application, what we've, uh, each application instance, what we've done in Istio Ambient is that we've split up the responsibilities of la layer seven. Uh, and this includes things like uh, request retries and header-based match-based uh, uh, load balancing and traffic splitting. Uh, those, those fault injection, those types of capabilities from the, uh, the capabilities that are needed to secure the, the, the traffic in, in the service mesh. Um, so we've, we've created a, um, a secure overlay layer that focuses on the security properties of the mesh. So mutual TLS, um, you know, authorization policies, some limited authorization policies, and that forms the foundation of the zero trust aspects of the mesh that can then, you can layer on the layer seven um, capabilities as needed. So, so you'll be able to opt into, uh, into that. And we do that with, uh, like I said, two different layers of the data plane. The layer seven layer is implemented by Envoy Proxy and you'll see that in our, uh, in our workshop today. And uh, layer four is, uh, is implemented it, it, it technically is Envoy today, but that is going to be optimized to be, uh, to be something else going forward. It doesn't need to be Envoy. Um, the Istio control plane is still, so Istio D and, and what you see, if you're familiar with the sidecar approach, the, uh, the Istio control plane is still there, and that is what serves the configuration to the, um, the, the secure overlay layer that we'll see. And to the layer seven proxies, which we call waypoint proxies. Um, just like it does today, it connects up to the sidecars and gives it uh, configuration updates and um, uh, takes care of uh, routing and, and the security um, properties. Uh, the, we, you see the same thing, the SDOD is doing the same thing with, uh, with, with these layer four and layer seven proxies as well. Now this is, uh, this is one aspect of what we at Solo have been working on. That is uh, the, uh, the Glue platform that allows you to abstract away a lot of the details of operating and running a mesh 
And now, not just at the top layers, your workflow layers, but now down at the, uh, the workload layers as well, where you don't, the, the, the developers, when you deploy your applications, you don't see any, uh, any of these sidecar uh, proxies. So now going a level lower into the details and setting up the, uh, the workshop that you'll be walking through is uh, that secure overlay layer that I mentioned that operates at layer three, layer four. That is implemented with a data plane components called a Z-Tunnel. And I mentioned when we released Istio Ambient, Z-Tunnel was or is based on Envoy, but only using the layer four capabilities and the MTLS uh, capabilities of Envoy. Mostly for expediency is why that, that landed the way it did on an initial release. But that's being optimized right now. Uh, I think last week in, in the community we were, we were discussing a, a Rust-based uh, implementation um, and, uh, and, and, and further optimizing the uh, way we configured that component and its actual runtime uh, characteristics. And so we'll see in the workshops that we can use the secure overlay layer that uses these Z-Tunnel agents to implement the zero trust uh, capabilities of the mesh without introducing layer seven uh, capabilities, and then layer in those uh, more advanced capabilities on top of uh, the, the secure tunnel, uh, secure overlay mechanisms. When we do that, we'll be introducing a layer seven proxy that we call the waypoint proxy. The waypoint proxy is uh, an, a policy enforcement point for, these, uh, for individual workloads. In the previous talks, we pointed out that the waypoint proxy is deployed per service account. So that's very similar to the model that we see today with the sidecars, where each service account gets its own identity. In the sidecar model, it's the same thing that happens in, uh, in the Istio ambient data plane as well. When traffic goes from an application to another application, it will first traverse the Z tunnel and you know, that's where the, the security properties will be implemented. And then if it needs to go to a layer seven waypoint proxy, that communication will be encrypted with mutual TLS. And then the waypoint proxy will then apply whatever layer seven uh, functionality or behavior that needs to take place and then send the traffic off to the, the destination. And that will happen over mutual TLS as well. The, uh, the communication protocol, the overlay that we use between the Z-tunnels themselves or between the Z-tunnel and the waypoint proxies is a, um, is a, is a mechanism that uh, is built on HTTP and is built to support uh, various intricacies of, of protocols and, uh, and, and uses mutual TLS to, uh, to uh, authenticate the, the traffic on both sides. So I purposely went a little quick. This is not supposed to be a deep dive on, uh, on Istio Ambient because I want you to get hands-on. Like I said, see the previous sessions from earlier today. Check out the Istio Ambient to Explain book. Uh, but now let's, uh, let's get hands-on and actually run the workshop. So if you go to this, this URL that you see on here, that should take you to the workshop environment. And I'll have Ron walk, walk you through uh, those, those parts. We'll use this tool called Instruct. Um, you know, think of it as just a, a web browser educational environment, where in that, uh, in that, in your browser, you should be able to access the full terminal as well as the instructions. And we'll spin up Kubernetes clusters uh, in that environment, and then run through the process of installing Istio Ambient um, and deploy some applications and kind of play around with it. So, if you go to this URL, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay, if you go to this URL, you'll get taken to an instruct page where it'll say, you know, add this particular workshop to my study room, and then you'll go to the study room and you should be able to kick off uh, the workshop. So I will switch uh, my windows and share my workshop environment. Once you add it to your study room and launch the workshop, you'll get a screen that kind of looks like this. And then if you hit start, You'll see a terminal on your left. Think of this terminal right now as just connected to a, a virtual machine where there's nothing on there yet. Um, you know, except some CLI tools like kubectl um, that we'll leverage today. 
Um, is everyone on the screen? Uh, any troubles? It might take about, I don't know, like 30 seconds to a minute for, for the loading to complete. But can I get a thumbs up if someone's like done and they're, they're, they're seeing the screen? Okay, so one. Okay, a couple. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll pause like another 20 seconds or so. Yeah, I, I saw a few thumbs up. Okay, great. So like I said, the, the stuff on the left is your terminal and the things on the right are, your, um, are the instructions that you're gonna follow. So the format of this lab today, um, I will do this step and I'll kind of uh, annotate it and give any information about what that step is doing. And then I'll, be like, I'll pause for like a couple of seconds and then for you to do this, to the same step um, with me. First step is just to export uh, an environment variable for simplicity's sake for us so, so that we can reuse this environment variable later on in the lab. And then we will deploy um, a cluster, a local client cluster that's gonna run inside this virtual machine. So this process takes about a couple minutes, but essentially we're just spinning up a, a kind cluster called, uh, which we're gonna call cluster one, so that'll be the name of the context. And then if you want to see exactly what this is doing, um, while, so while, while this is running, because this takes a couple minutes, uh, you can click on the Files tab, and then if you open up the directory structure on the left, you'll see these, these three folders. This, the, the contents of these folders are going to be the files that we're going to use in the lab today. So this first um, file that we're looking at right now is this deploy multi sh, and this is what is deploying this kind cluster. The kind cluster is going to be a four node Kubernetes cluster. Um, and, and the fact that it's four nodes is going to be a point that we're gonna come back to later. So think about how nodes relate to the Z tunnels. Um, and then you'll see the, the, the mapping between the two a little bit later in the lab. Okay, so my, my script is complete. Um, the next step just verifies that the cluster is up and running. Um, it's just checking to see if all the pods in the cube system namespaces are up and running. So if this second script returns, that means that you're, you're good to go to continue with the lab. So for me, it's still waiting. That just means that the pods and the cube system namespace are still kind of spinning up. All right, so I'm done. My Kubernetes cluster is, is up and running. So if I do kubectl get nodes, you'll see my four node group cluster. And then if I, do, if I list the pods in the kube system namespace, for example, you'll see um, you know, things like kube proxy uh, and running. Cool, so most of you should be about this step right now. So we have a clean Kubernetes cluster, the next thing we'll do is we'll deploy Istio. Um, you know, just like with, with any standard Istio, uh, you don't have to download the, the right binaries, right? Um, ambient is still in experimental, so it's, it's still in preview mode, so it's in an experimental branch. So this wget command goes to that location and gets the, the right binary. So we're downloading the Istio cuddle binary from that experimental branch location. And then extract it. And then you see we have the Istio cuddle binary. This is the experimental one. And then we will install Istio using that binary. So Istio cuddle install. But notice here, I'm setting the profile to ambient. So the way you install Istio is the same way you install Istio today. Just like you have your default minimal demo profile, there's just another profile for ambient, and this profile, if you go look at um, like the, the manifest directory and pull up ambient.yaml, you'll see that it, how it configures things like the deployment of ZTunnel, sets up the CNIs to route traffic from your pod to ZTunnel, et cetera. So let's give that a minute to finish.
once we completed that installation command, if we check the pods in the Istio system namespace, you'll now see, obviously you'll see Istio D and the Istio ingress gateway, but now we also see four Z tunnels. And the reason why we see four is because Z tunnel is deployed per node basis and we have four Kubernetes nodes, so there's four Z tunnels. So what we've done so far is just install Istio in, um, with the ambient profile. But we don't have any applications yet, so let's do that next. We will deploy the sample application and uh, pay attention to this diagram that's right above the deploy sample application command. Essentially, we're just gonna use a sleep a client app that's gonna call the web API service. The web API calls a recommendation and a recommendation calls purchase history. So it's just a chain of upstreams. And if you're interested in looking at you know, what exactly you know, the, de the deployment, the service, the service accounts looks like, you can always click on the files tab like I did before and, uh, and pull up that YAML. So once you deployed that, if you look at uh, kubectuttle get pods, you'll see my five applications that are running in the default namespace. Of course, there is no sidecar for any of these because I didn't label my namespace for Istio injection or anything like that. It's just standard Kubernetes containers deployments. To make sure that they're working, we're gonna exec into the sleep container and then from there, we'll call, going back up to this diagram, from the sleep container, we're gonna exec into that and from there, we're gonna call web API. Web API is gonna call recommendation. Recommendation is gonna call purchase history. If you look at the output that from the curl command, which called web API, you can see that you know, this stuff from the top is from web API, but web API calls a recommendation and it embeds that response into its own response. So if you look in the JSON one step in deeper, you'll see this is a recommendation. And then if you go look at one more level into it, you'll see purchase history. And then the, the 200, 200, 200 means that all three of them succeeded well. <laughs> Next, we'll use the Istio gateway and virtual service resources to expose the web API service through the Istio ingress gateway. So again, you know, take a look at those files if you're interested. Uh, um, if, if you're interested in the YAML. But, but yeah, it's just a standard gateway object that listens on a particular host and then it uses a virtual service to, to route from that gateway to the web API service. Um, we'll set this environment variable to the IP address of the Istio Ingress gateway service and then if I do a curl and specify the right host, I should be able to get the same command that I got going through sleep. So now we're just accessing directly to web API from the Istio ingress gateway, there's no sleep involved. So we're still kind of setting the stage for everything. We did install Istio, but we're not using it yet. We're still, you know, all basic Kubernetes stuff. I'm pausing a couple of seconds to make sure everyone's on the same step. Okay. In this next portion of the lab, what we'll do is use TCP dump to sniff the network traffic. So we, we've called Web API from Sleep and from uh, Ingress Gateway. Web API called other services. So by doing TCP dump, if I look at, you know, if I sniff some packets, you'll see, for example, in, in my output, I see that somebody called the recommendation service on port 8080. And furthermore, I can see all the headers and, and information about that particular request. So this means that this connection was not encrypted and someone was able to use TCP dump to actually read that data. So we're still kind of like laying down all the groundwork and then the next portion of the lab, we'll start using ambient. So if you're done with that, click on check and can I get some like thumbs up that you know we're at this stage? Awesome. So y'all are able to keep up just fine. So I'll kind of increase my speed a little bit. 
Next thing we'll do is we'll add those sample applications to ambient. And the way to do that is to label that namespace, the default namespace, with istio.io slash data plane mode equals ambient. So similar to the sidecar mode where you're labeling it with injection equals enabled or the, whatever the revision flag is, we just have a new label for ambient. The beauty of ambient is that you don't have to restart your applications. Um, it is just turning it on and turning it off, right? Like right now, I just turned on ambient mode and all the applications that are in this namespace are part of the mesh. And to prove that, we can look at the logs up the Istio CNI pod and you can see that it is configuring the routing rules, the, you know, the outbound and inbound routing rules from those applications. So from this, uh, from the CNI log, you'll see sleep, web API, um, and, and whatever the other applications are that are running in that namespace. So it's the CNI that's watching for new pods and existing pods and then configuring it to, to route traffic to Z-Tunnel. And we already covered, you know, Christian already covered what exactly Z-Tunnel is and how it works, et cetera. So the next thing we'll do is we will generate a lot of traffic so that we can look at some metrics. So this next curl command will generate, will go from sleep and call web API a hundred times and then you'll just see the, the, the response code information. So you can see they're all 200s. So now after I send a hundred requests to the web API service, if I take a look at the logs of one of the Z tunnels or, or all the Z tunnels, if I look at the Z tunnel pod logs, you'll see information in here about uh, traffic that is going through the Z tunnels. Right, so if you look at this IP address here, there's source and destination IP address, and those IP addresses would map to the Z tunnel pod IPs. Just like before, we'll run the TCP dump command again, and then see if we're able to sniff any traffic. So I see some packets, but this time, this is not readable. So this is showing me that whatever this data is uh, from TCP dump output is encrypted. The next step verifies that basically that this IP address that you see in the top of this TCP dump is actually coming from, oh, it actually references these Z tunnel pod IP addresses. So if you're interested in looking into that in more detail. Okay, so what have we accomplished so far? So just by installing Istio and labeling the namespace, we've achieved MTLS from um, Z tunnel to Z tunnel, uh, meaning that node to node com communication between the pods is encrypted. Um, I didn't have to restart any workloads. I didn't have to configure any additional policies. You just get this encryption straight out of the box. So encryption authentication is one thing, right? Uh, we, we talked about how Z-Tunnel uses the application's certificates to initiate connections on behalf of the application. Um, but now we can do things with that identity, with that strong identity. And one of the things that we can do with Istio with strong identity is layer um, authorization policies. So the very first authorization policies basically creates an allow nothing, um, zero trust, no one's allowed to talk to anybody else foundation layer. So now that I have this allow nothing authorization policies, if I try to do the same curl command again from the, from the ingress gateway, um, here, let me copy just the curl command. You can see that I get, you know, reset, con reset reason connection upstream error. So now we have to explicitly allow communication from one service to another service. So that's what the, the next set of authorization policies will do. I mean, really the, the takeaway point from, from, from this part of the lab is that the enforcement points for your authorization policies are now happening 
at Z tunnel. We don't need a waypoint proxy for you to do layer four um, authorization policies. So for MTLS and, and, and TCP layer four authorization policies, you do not need a waypoint proxy. So now that we've cre explicitly create authorization policies on who's allowed to talk to, to who else, then uh, if I do another curl command, um, if I redo the curl command as before, you can see now I'm getting good responses back from my user. I also have a deployment called not sleep that does not have authorization policies. So if, I, if you try to exec into not sleep and try to curl one of the web API services or one of the services in the mesh, then you'll see that it's not able to, to make that connection as you'd expect. Is everyone able to reach this section? Great. Uh, for the next section, I'll hand it over to Nim from Google. Yep. Thanks, Ron. How's everyone doing so far? You good? Okay. That's awesome. I saw someone walk in kind of last minute, so I just want to put up this uh, tiny URL back up on the slides for anyone that wants to start the workshop. Um, but I also do want to uh, quickly recap what we just did, uh, and we have a few visuals here. So, of course, we created a client cluster with four nodes. We uh, then installed Istio uh, as we normally do using Istio CTL install, except, of course, our profile that we used was called Ambient. Um, and all, it does a bunch of things, but like the, the main thing that, the main takeaway here is that it uh, deploys a Z tunnel for each node that takes care of all of Istio's L4 uh, functionality for you, and we also deployed a bunch of uh, test uh, test apps that we could play around with, um, and we also saw that the way to enable uh, ambient mode uh, or the Z tunnel on a specific namespace is by just labeling it with this uh, label. Um, so everything we've seen so far was just L4 stuff. Um, and what we've uh, at least learned from our users at Google is um, Istio, um, a lot of users just need the L4 stuff. Uh, and the majority of um, Istio users at this point can you know, stop or if they want to continue uh, adding on the L7 functionality, they can do so. And they still benefit from this ambient model because adoption is a lot easier. Because most people adopt with uh, L4 first. Um, so this next section is purely about L7. Um, and we're going to start off by looking at a, um, an L7 authorization policy. Um, more specifically, what we're going to do is, so right now, Sleep can talk to Web API. Right? That's what we did in the previous section. Um, but we're going to be a bit more granular about how we um, allow communication from Sleep to Web API. And we're going to say allow only GET requests, and we're going to do that by just deploying a authorization uh, policy, which you'll see down here. Um, and for us to actually apply that authorization policy and see it work, the Web API needs a waypoint proxy um, attached to its service account. Um, so the way to do that, the way to deploy a waypoint proxy right now is to use the uh, Kubernetes gateway, um, gateway resource. And uh, it's important to note that this is the, the, the Kubernetes um, resource and not the Istio gateway resource. Um, and you can see that we're attaching it to the service account of the web, web API. And we're saying, hey, let's use the um, waypoint proxy from Istio's ambient mesh. Um, so let's go ahead and do that now. Um, the very first command here is exactly that. We're going to apply our gateway. And next, we're just going to check that the waypoint proxy deployment has been deployed. Um, so we're just doing a kubectl get pods, um, and we're looking for our waypoint proxy. And there it is. And 
the next thing, of course, is applying the authorization policy that says, hey, we're only going to allow traffic um, from the um, ingress gateway or the uh, sleep service to our web API that uh, is in the form of a get request. All right, so we're just applying a more granular rule here. And then let's test this out. So now if I were to just make a get request from the sleep service to the web API, it should work. All right. Um, and that's your 200 response. Um, but of course, if I try to now make a delete request, it shouldn't work. So somewhere um, in here, you should see access denied. Um, yep, it's actually just hidden right there. Okay, so that's just a bit of uh, more granular authorization policies. We'll also uh, make note that the Waypoint proxy, once it's deployed for the Web API service account, um, you've also now got access to L7 observability of that web API uh, service. So we're just gonna confirm that here by just looking at an endpoint inside of our waypoint proxy that Prometheus would use uh, for that observability. Um, and then you should see something that looks kind of like what I'm seeing here. Um, and then the next section here, we're just doing a bit more uh, playing around with um, L7 um, policies. But um, I've got a visualization here for that too. Um, what we're doing now is we're saying, um, let's, let's make a delay. Uh, Let's add a delay of five seconds for any requests going into Web API that contain uh, the user Amy inside of the HTTP headers. Um, so, of course, that is done in Istio using a uh, virtual service. Um, so here we're just applying an Istio virtual service, and we're saying let's apply this fixed delay of five seconds, and um, it should only apply if we see uh, the user Amy inside the HTTP header that reaches the web API. So let's apply this now. Okay. And now if I try to access, uh, or rather if I try to uh, make a HTTP request with uh, user Amy inside of our header, I should see a five second delay I was just pressing enter now. So one, two, three. And there we go. Um, so that's a bit more of uh, Istio's L7 functionality with the waypoint proxy. Um, and this final section here is doing a bit more L7 stuff. Um, and you can see that uh, I guess I can show you the visualization as well. Um, we're playing around with a bit of traffic splitting here. Um, we're saying for the purchase history service, we're gonna deploy two versions of it, version one and version two. Uh, and then we're gonna say, put 90% of any traffic going in the purchase history service, um, put 90% of that traffic to version one and 10% to version two. And of course, because uh, the, the policy is being applied on the purchase history uh, service, we now need to deploy a waypoint proxy for that purchase history um, service account. Um, so that's uh, the very first thing that we should be doing. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, let's look at that. So we're again using a gateway apply to say, hey, um, look, um, apply this Istio mesh um, waypoint proxy to the service, uh, service account called purchase history. 
Um, so let's first actually deploy version two of our purchase history. Um, and again, kind of like what Ram mentioned, if you go into this files tab, you can see the exact contents of uh, that folder that we just kubectl applied. Um, and let me go back here. And I'm gonna apply the gateway now to deploy the waypoint proxy for purchase history. And then I'm going to apply our Istio virtual service uh, to apply the traffic splitting, the 90%, 10% traffic splitting. And you can see right there where it's saying version one should get 90%. So at this point, if I, um, right, so I've, I guess I've also got to define the uh, two versions as subsets um, using Istio's uh, destination rules. So this is just saying, um, splitting up the, uh, the two different pods that I've uh, um, deployed and uh, contextualizing it for Istio as version one and version two. Um, and now at this point, if I make a whole bunch of requests, uh, I think we're making 100 requests here, to the uh, web API, the web API talks to the purchase history. Um, so we should see that later that 90% uh, goes to version uh, one, 10% goes to version two. So let's uh, do that right now. Right, so you can see that about 10 of those, uh, nine of those uh, 100 requests were, uh, went to purchase history version two. And uh, the curl output just tells you which version that's why you can just grep it um, and uh, see that it's version two that uh, we're reaching. Okay, so at this point, yep, go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, have you applied your destination rule? Okay. Yep. Thanks, Christine. Does anyone else have any questions or any? Did anyone reach it? Yep, go ahead. Uh, sorry, what's that? Um, the question was, where are the certificates coming from back in the layer four stuff? Um, uh, I, I can take that. Chris, you want to yeah. cover that? Yeah, it, it, it's coming from STOD. So the Z tunnels will make a call to Istio D. Istio D is still your CA. Um, Z tunnel is just acting on behalf of, your, of the application that's, that's spun up and said, hey, give me certificates for web API pod. And then Istio D gives it the certificates. And then Z tunnel uses that certificate to make a connection to the other Z tunnel. The, uh, Istio D is still your CA, and you can still configure Istio D to use a different CA if you wanted to, just like, like you do today. Like, how, how Istio D gets its, gets its certificate, whether it's self-signed or integrated with the PKI, that stays the same. Yep. Is there anything else you want to add? Okay, cool. Thanks, Rob. Do we have any more questions in the meantime? Yep, so I guess that's the section about uh, L7 um, functionality using the waypoint proxy. And once you're done this entire section, you can just click check there. And then we're gonna be navigated to the bonus section. 
So the bonus section is really just answering one question that a lot of folks have, which is whether I can still use sidecars, um, and the answer is yes. Um, and yes, the ambient mesh and the sidecar pattern will still interoperate. Um, and sidecars will remain a first class citizen of Istio. Um, so this section is just go going to uh, just confirm that. Um, so in this section, we're actually deploying the uh, familiar HTTP bin service into the HTTP uh, separate namespace. Um, so let's first create that namespace. And then we are going to um, inject uh, a sidecar or enable a sidecar injection in that uh, new namespace that we created. And then we're going to deploy the HTTP bin service. So you can see it's got its own service account. It's uh, also pulling in this image here, um, HTTP bin. And let me just apply this here. And so now, because we enabled uh, sidecar injection, if I do kubectl get uh, pods from that namespace, the HTTP bin namespace, I should see that there is a sidecar attached to it. Um, and now if I uh, curl from, um, from the sleep service, which is using the ambient mesh uh, Z tunnels to the HTTP bin service. Um, I'll see that in my response. Um, my response should say um, somewhere here, it should say X forwarded client sir. Yeah, there you go. So that's how you can confirm that uh, the traffic between the uh, HTTP bin service, which is using a sidecar for its L4 Istio stuff, uh, is being encrypted as well. Um, and that concludes our bonus section, and that actually concludes the entire workshop. So um, I guess in, during this time, we'll probably just field around and uh, get questions, or if folks are stuck anywhere, we can help out. Yeah, like Nick said, um, we're going to be walking around kind of helping people out. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask any um, I, I did want to share that we do have a survey link. One second. Let me see if I can find my... I don't know where my share button went. There it is. Okay, so there's two more URLs for you. There's a certification exam. I think it's like 10 or 20 questions or so, and if you answer like above 80%, then Solo will send you like a certification badge that you can add to LinkedIn. Um, I don't know, share it within your organization, share it with your manager. Um, there's also a survey link. If you like this workshop and, and you wanna see more of this type of content, um, you know, please share any feedback that you have, positive or negative, and, and just know that um, Solo will run these type of workshops pretty often um, virtually. So if you go to Solo.io and go to upcoming events, you'll see that every week or so, we have workshops around um, beginner, intermediate, and advanced Istio content, things around Envoy, um, Ambient, GraphQL, you know, a lot of the stuff that we work on, we, we build a workshop and we do these free workshops uh, along with an instructor that comes with it and, and, and annotates the content like we did today. Um, so with that said, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, again, we'll be walking around answering any questions.